Instead of using many appliances over the years, just use one to consume less and save more. Miele products are designed to last for 20 years. That's quality ahead of its time. Miele. Immer besser. All right, we can get started. So I'm going to talk about the schoolhouse and uh, get started. So really the world of work is changing. And so the way we lead in organizations must change as well. Uh, the Google School for Leaders is a unique initiative within Google and they came to us to help us navigate this change. How do you craft an environment and an experience that equips leaders with not only the skills, but the mindsets they need to lead brilliantly and effectively in the 21st century. So we set out with this question at the forefront, but really at the root of the challenge is developing an experience that allows leaders to bring their whole selves and to build and to practice empathy. We worked with the Google School for Leaders team with Maya Razone at the helm and several, a lot of other strategic partners over the course of a year and over many smaller prototypes. Developing a framework for a new way of learning that's tailored to each individual leader and supports their evolution fully. And as part of that effort, the Schoolhouse was born. Um, it's their first prototype space for in-person learning that shifts how faculty teach, how participants engage, and how experiences are delivered. From the immersive arrival to the extension of an outdoor classroom with an edible garden and all, Multi-sensory engagement was the driver for every decision with the intent to open mindsets to new experiences. And if anything, we know now that the flatness and the dullness of this digital experience these past two years have left us more hungry than ever for this type of engagement. Located at Google's headquarters in Mountain View, California, the schoolhouse draws company leaders from across the world for classes, workshops, and training for anywhere from one to three day engagements. Its location on campus was first debated a lot, um, but in the end, its relationship to the heart of the work was required to really support this as a true prototype for the schoolhouse uh, to ensure that there were consistent and numerous opportunities to test. It sits at the edge of an unoccupied Google workspace. The entry and arrival are unassuming, but it offered a really unique potential um, to transform and challenge participants' perceptions once they move through the arrival sequence. The large open room is broken into three spaces by two sets of theatrical curtains, allowing the room to expand and contract through the day and the course of a program. There are four large spinning bookshelves at each corner of the space that prompts and create the way that the space will be activated. There are access to views of the patio beyond, and there's really, it's designed to be at the final reveal in a series of spectacle transitions that's built into the sequence of the curriculum. All of this to offer multiple postures, transitions, and possibilities to not only engage leaders, through the event, but to continuously surprise and challenge their perceptions of the schoolhouse each time they enter. So we built an immersive installations into the initial arrival as a cue of what's beyond, and it's the first step in shedding the participants' preconceived notions. The scratch and sniff wallpaper um, and a large scale jump rope uh, wind chime overhead designed to build anticipation and stimulate an emotional response. But once through the doors, participants are prompted to store their personal items, even their technology, as they're asked to enter the experience fully with no distractions. Drawing inspiration from theater, including staging and the way things work behind the curtain, literally during an event, the lifting of the curtain not only signals movement into the large classroom, but it can be timed and sequenced with music or performance to invite wonder and, spe and spectacle into the curriculum. From the beginning of the day until the end, the space activates discovery and wonder through multi-sensory components that prompt heightened engagement, optimizing learning by inviting the participant in. 
And because we prioritize this participant engagement, we designed in visual cues that give agency to the leaders and educators, empowering them to move, push, rotate, touch, change, and personalize their experience. Sofas and plants sit on wheels, bookshelves spin, curtains lift, artifacts can be picked up and examined. Breakout rooms for participants to synthesize information and reflect on topics in smaller groups lie in the open space. They have unique personalities inspired by Jungian archetypes that can be tailored using music, scent, light, color, and temperature. Even the signage are simple. Printed transparencies can be changed out to correspond with learning topics. Employing the principles of neuroaesthetics with the help of the school's research partner, Susan Maxman of the International Arts and Mind Lab, Really understanding why and how our nervous system responds to sensory stimuli was an anchor in building a space that addresses the physical, mental, and emotional needs of each participant as they move through the curriculum. You know, for example, participants can explore sense as gateways to memory, which can start to influence behavior, mood, performance, creativity. Additionally, we developed the tools to effectively help the faculty and operations staff to activate the schoolhouse. These cards are tactile artifacts, as well as digital tools that took cues from pop, kids' pop-up books, really that, to pull that wonder and discovery thread through to every touch point of the experience. Operations staff were also given cookbook-style guidelines that drove the setup of the spaces and pop-up events to ensure a holistic and seamless operation. Both the cookbooks and these how-to interactive cards demonstrate ways that that space can unlock future possibilities for the faculty and the operators. All of this in service to developing empathetic and effective leaders that can meet the challenges of their dynamic business and social environment. Ones that can mature and evolve as quickly as the world demands. All of these parts and pieces, layers of nuance and theatrics energy, delight, and wonder is born out of the passion that our client came to us with, really determined to prove that where we learn and how we learn is every bit as important as what we learn. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Um, <clears throat> who would like to begin? Again. Hi, Kelly. Thank you. Um, I love the space. I've been studying your space for a while, and um, I think it's really beautiful. Um, there's a lot of <laughs> photos that you didn't show, but I think it's, yeah, even better. So you know it, Tony. Space. Have you actually been there? No, I saw it online. I've been studying for a while. Uh -huh. um, my question is how do they pick you, um, Rap Studio, and uh, being Google, being Google, then I'm sure they have a SOP already and they have maybe massive guidelines. So how do you overcome their guidelines and the push beyond? Because it's not the normal Google space that we see. So there must be a lot of invention or negotiations in between what we want as Rap Studio and what the client. And my final question is what the budget is like. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> First, the, the guidelines, you know, we do work with Google on a lot of other spaces. And so, yes, are, are very well versed in, in a lot of the guidelines that happen here. This was, is, it is and remains to be a, a one-off um, experience, which served the, you know, the purpose of the experiment and the prototype really well. Um, I mentioned the leader um, kind of at the helm of this. Uh, she really pushed for some of those guidelines not to kind of really in, uh, hinder the development. Um, you know, one of the examples would be the, the GVC or their Google video requirements um, was a big one in this space. They typically uh, don't have multiple sessions running in one space. So that was a big kind of fight, not a fight, a negotiation um, to tell them that this was in service again to the curriculum and to the needs of the space. Um, budget was good. I mean, it was, um, uh, a balance. Um, we had value propositions in the beginning, so we put a lot of um, energy and effort to the things that would really adapt this space, but we were willing to um, rethink selections of items and utilize the 
uh, something was slated for this project previously, we utilized most all of the um, finishes that were already procured. So we were really creative um, with what we had and um, you know, really smart about what we really spent money on. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, could you? Hey, it's funny, like I, I got the same, the, the, the first question that came to my head was budget because if one think of Google as a client that, you know, the budget will be huge. And, but looking at this project, you think maybe the budget was quite limited. So, the, but you said that the budget was quite well because it, it's really like a setting, you know, um, you could do it in any warehouse and it's like a theater, as you said, you know, the curtain goes up and down, you move the furniture. For me, it, mm -hmm. how, how much of your time you felt that you're really investing in design beyond the, the, the idea of the organization and the reorganization and the, the kind of simple basic attitude or, or the, the, the going beyond the, the, the very needed thing today, you know, to, to be in a group and to be with the people and to sit in a house and not just having, you know, the, like what we have now, Zoom. But how much of your time you felt you're designing versus, you know, thinking of the idea as a first idea and or, about organization? Was there? Well, yeah, one of, one of the things um, that you know, I wanted to pinpoint in the beginning too is that we, we spent almost a year prototyping um, these experiences in different scales. So when they first came to us, we were um, we were crafting these um, experience kits for participants that were uh, at resorts. So, so a lot of these events were happening at resorts or other destinations. And we started to create smaller like tactile and physical kind of pop-ups um, that were based on um, very specific points in curriculum. And then they had a lot of partners that were um, uh, like set designers, theatric, de you know, um, uh, industrial designers creating things like where you put the, your bags in, um, bookshelves and, you know, phone chargers and all of these like props that were part of the experience. So these were tested for a really long time, um, which really allowed us when we got to the space to move faster than normal. Um, we even had a version, I mean, speaking of budget, we had a version of this that we did in all cardboard, um, uh, that we designed in all cardboard to really meet a, a lower budget once that was what it was posed to us at some point that we needed to adapt. Um, so I think, again, that stressing all of that experimentation up front allowed us to adapt and move very quickly um, as each problem or each you know, challenge arised in the design process and execution process. I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, yeah. Can I pitch in for a second? Um, Kelly, can you explain who yeah. actually decides to move the curtains or the furniture? Is it the participants or is there somebody there to kind of operate? Is it a sort of really a self-adjusting, like an early archigram environment which responds to the user sort of directly? Yeah, it, it has initial start. So the faculty are the designers, they call them um, architects or designers of the curriculum. And they, uh, learning the space is essential for them to really have an idea or a concept of how they want to set the space. So there are operators that will set it for, let's say there's one day, there might be three different ways the room is set in that one day. So there are operators behind the scenes and, and that's why we like this behind the curtain concept. Um, that while the curtain's down, a room could be set up, the next kind of layer of the room could be set up beyond. But from there, um, that first initial set, sometimes it's planned into the curriculum for participants to move things. The bookshelf spinning, um, that can happen, if, of course, if there's not furniture in front of it um, during the day. But the smaller artifacts like plants on wheels and um, you know, people adjusting their sofas or their seats to be able to face people in different postures, um, being able to grab cushions or pads for your seat, um, being able to grab artifacts off the wall. And I think specifically the user engagement when it came to lighting, um, you know, color, temperature, we can, you know, change color um, and light temperature, the, you know, music, sound, audio, um, there's scents that you can pick up as pouches and grab them and walk around with you. Um, 
you know, that the scale of you, the scale um, gets a little bit smaller once it gets into user engagement. And at the largest scale, we're really depending on the operators. Um, but it's quite easy to spin those bookshelves. You can just spin them with like your finger. So it doesn't require any heavy lifting. And that was a big part of the plan. We didn't want anyone to lift anything heavy if they wanted to move it. Manuel. Please. The curtains are a button, so they're pro programmed in. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I'm very, I'm very impressed by the by by, by the process, and and my question is, uh, uh, I have two questions, but they are they are linked together. Do the users occupy the building since a long time now, and do you follow the users? It means, uh, do you have some comments from them? Uh, do you have ideas how to improve? I mean, do you do you? continue working with the users to to progressively adapt the building to uh, to new workshops to new uh, way of 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 uh, of living inside yeah i it is aspirationally that was going to be the case i mean this launched really close to us the pandemic and ev everyone going home um, and it's just picking back up again. While when it first okay. launched, uh, the building was unoccupied. Um, but since the, the the Google, well, it was the the space was used consistently. Mm. Um, and then the Google School for Leaders team actually moved in and worked in that space. So they moved their organization to kind of work out of that space, um, and that allowed them to kind of tweak and test things a lot more often. Mm. Um, the experiences that came into the space were, I mean, they've, they've been, it's been very well received. And I think it's inspired um, how to shift some of their other, like their tech rooms or their tech talks and um, some of their other programmatic spaces throughout the Google campus. Uh, it has become a bit of a beacon of how to rethink what that means to engage people in larger groups and to invite experiences in. Um, we worked on those pop-up and user cards after the space was launched um, oh. to really onboard everyone. So we were able to tweak and learn things even as we were moving through that process. Mm -hmm. The client is, I consider her a friend, so I do talk to her often. Um, she has moved on to really focusing on the curriculum and the program and, and has let the, the space um, be operated at the hands of her team but they are in talks with us to um, tweak and move and shift things as needed as, as mm. things come up. And those requests have picked up again, which is nice. So they're back, mm. I think, using it. Those requests are coming in. Mm. Mm. Oliver. It's interesting. I'm excited to see yes. now that everyone starts to go back. <laughs> I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, <clears throat> I can't help thinking, I mean, the project to me seems to build quite a lot on the legacy of Xerox Park in the 1970s where you know there was this idea that instead of sitting around in meetings you could sit around in, on bean bags and you unleash creativity by giving users control over their environment so i was just wondering what would you say is the revolutionary step that you've introduced with this project that kind of really advances that legacy i think that there's outside of just the ability to kind of move and 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 move your position. It's the it's truly about that multi-sensory, the layers, every layer throughout every experience. So it's not a, just about walking into the room. It's about you know the 50 feet before you get into that space, um, and really being crafting that. Um, it's like choreographing that experience in a way that doesn't feel choreographed. So that it invites a lot of engagement and um, honestly surprise, even for us as the designers, we want, you know, when we say we want to unlock future possibilities, we mean it. So the amount of nuance in every object that's in the space, um, you know, each transition as it happens, so, you know, the jump rope wind chime is next to a very small, like mm. digital installation, like digital, like um, arrow you know, mm -hmm. thing. And then um, there's objects and artifacts kind of starting to allude to what's beyond. And then when you get into the first space, you know, you start to, you start to understand and um, 
learn how the space might be used. But I think that that was the, the biggest, um, I mean, that was the most rigor that we put in as designers is, is actually visualizing and walking through each sequence of that chore you know, choreographed experience and making sure that we were never um, designing ourselves into like a blocked wall, like where no one could ever discover anything new.